In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Gospel from St. Luke this week, we encounter a side of Jesus that can be a little challenging for our contemplation. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, of course, by heralding him as the Prince of Peace. Throughout his life, Jesus works miracles. He heals the sick, he forgives sins, he even raises the dead, instructing others as he goes about this holy work, just as he instructed the woman he healed from, from bleeding, daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace. Jesus tells his disciples to proclaim peace upon the places they visit in the gospel. And before his arrest, Jesus gathers his disciples and assures them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. In the midst of all this talk of peace, it's disruptive to hear Jesus speaking so harshly in the text from St. Luke today. What does he mean when he says he comes to bring fire? What could he possibly be up to when he claims that he's bringing division? Households separated, father from son, mother from daughter. This does not seem to be the Jesus of the folk songs or the children's nativity play. And yet when we look closely, there's something that we can recognize. There's something important and substantive here. At first blush, this forceful proclamation can seem at odds with the gentle shepherd of the Gospels, but those very same Gospels have in fact already shown us that what Jesus is saying is true. Think with me about this. So when Jesus eats with sinners, yes, he's bringing peace to their table, but this action angers the ones who believe themselves to be righteous and they are not at peace. When Jesus embraces the people who are the least of these, when he calls to the little children and welcomes them into his circle, when he blesses the Samaritan woman at the well, when he meets the Gentile man burdened by a demon, he does bring peace to these people. But he brings a whole lot of disruption and division to the people who think that he's running with the wrong crowd. The evening where Jesus blesses his disciples and says, my peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, this is in fact the very evening when he is arrested and imprisoned, when there is violence, when it's only to drag him through the humiliation of the crucifixion that will happen just a few hours later. While Jesus speaks of peace, it is clear that the world around him often responds with division, violence, and hatred. And so Jesus here is not just prophesying about things that are to be, but is in fact describing something that is already true. And so perhaps it should not surprise us as much as it does to hear Jesus speak realistically about houses divided. This text find us, finds us in the 12th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, which is of course this part of Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem. He's already, at this point in the Gospels, already on his way to the cross. The cross, of course, being the ultimate division. Humanity's ultimate attempt to divide itself from God forever. And Jesus is here already on the way. The very beginning of this chapter finds Jesus condemning the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He says, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. Nothing is secret that will not someday be made known. I can imagine that there are people for whom that is not very happy news. He then teaches some rather disturbing lessons about wealth that we've heard read from our own gospels in church over the last few weeks. He offers the parable of the rich fool who plans to tear down his barns so that he might build up yet even bigger barns to hold all the wealth that he's managed to accumulate. And of course, that very evening, the man drops dead, proving that all of this material gain has always been worth nothing. I can imagine that there were those for whom this was not good news. And then we come to this precious glimpse of Jesus 
thinking about his own ministry. This is actually a very remarkable piece of the text because very often we have Jesus describing things around him. He's teaching other people, he's speaking to the people who listen to him. But every so often we get this precious little vignette of almost like a monologue of Jesus reflecting to himself on the nature of his own ministry. It's almost as, almost as if we are with him in his mind and heart, encountering on this sort of meta level his own experience of being the Son of God. When we look closely, this claim of Jesus that he will bring division isn't shocking because it's violent. It's not shocking because it's strange, and it's not even shocking because it's intimate. It's shocking because we know it's already true. It rattles us on some level because we know these divisions ourselves. These divisions that can feel impossible to adequately name or reconcile. I don't have a, I, I mean I do have, but this, this example that I'll use is not a modern example necessarily, but it's a good one. This past week, the church calendar was blessed with many of my very favorite feasts of the late summer season. And on August 11th, we commemorated the feast of St. Clair of Assisi. Now St. Clair, of course, is most famous for founding her religious order for women in the 13th century that's known today as the Poor Clares. And she famously partnered with St. Francis to begin this fresh form of religious life founded upon a commitment to radical poverty. During the High Middle Ages, many, if not most, of the monasteries became these places of immense wealth and privilege because sons and daughters of noble houses would enter religious life and they would bring with them these vast inheritances of money and property. And so oftentimes, a monk or a nun would find themselves not consigned to some life of sacrifice for the gospel, but instead surrounded by luscious fabrics and beautiful altar plates encrusted with jewels and choice food and all the books that they could dream of. And it wasn't a life of very Christ-like poverty at all. St. Francis rejected this abundance outright. He read the gospel. He saw what it was to be Jesus aligning himself with the least of these. And he professed a life of complete dependence on the charity of others. St. Clair, one evening, I, I just absolutely love this, the fact that the saints of our church knew one another. They encountered one another. They inspired one another. Just think about what the person in the pew next to you could be inspiring in your own life and vocation as a servant of God. St. Clair actually heard St. Francis preaching and that very evening decided that she wanted to give all of her many, many treasures away to the church and follow Christ in St. Francis's radical form of poverty. On the evening of Palm Sunday in the year 1212, she traveled to the church with a maid, she cut off her hair, and she laid her jewels and fine gown upon the altar and declared that God was her only spouse now and forever, amen. Much of the religious establishment of the day was infuriated by Francis and Claire, including Claire's own family, father against son, mother against daughter. How dare they disrupt the lives of the religious authorities? How dare they suggest that there was something wrong with the monasteries? How dare they give everything to the poor, sleep on the ground, reject these comforts that the priests had enjoyed and loved so well? Do not the servants of God deserve jeweled altar plates? Oh, how infuriated they were. Father against son, daughter against mother, priests against monks and nuns. It turns out that division has always been a part of authentic life in Christ. When Jesus is speaking of these things, he is not just predicting something dangerously and ominously, but is in fact describing the condition in which we find ourselves when we dare to serve something other than the world. Because on this side of heaven, any decision that aligns us with Jesus is bound to separate us from the things that work against him. Our world tells us that our political opponents are some type of enemy. Jesus tells us to love our enemies, even to pray for those who persecute us. 
Our world tells us to strive for greatness, strength, achievement, beauty. And Jesus tells us to surrender all and be like little children. Our world tells us to earn as much wealth as we possibly can, to cling to any modicum of security we possibly can, and to pass it along to the people that we love and who are related to us by blood. And Jesus tells us to give it away. Our world tells us that only certain people are deserving of love and affection and attention and respect. And Jesus tells us that we all belong to him and to one another. And on and on and on. As we are united with Christ, we are divided from the things that work against him. And although this is right, it is not generally easy. But Luke chapter 12, mercifully, is not the end of Jesus' story, and it's certainly not the end of ours. Because there is always one bridge capable of spanning any divide, no matter how dark, no matter how wide, no matter how deep. It has always been the case that there is no expanse of division wider than the arms of the cross. It stretches from the beginning of the first creation out into the completion of the creation to come. The cross gathers us in beginning to end. There is not a single part of humanity that cannot find its home there. It is like a pull on us, no matter how far we've strayed from it. It is like a poem in our native language, a reminder always about the greater truth of the kingdom of God. A reminder that no matter what words of division we have spoken, there is a deeper, more native song within us that sings always first of unity, reconciliation, and joy because of the expanse of the cross. On this side of heaven, we may indeed find ourselves face to face with the unhappy consequences of division, but we can take heart of all things in the paradox of the cross. For though the cross appeared to be that ultimate division, that ultimate separation of God and humanity, the ultimate victory of death and isolation and futility, the truth as the Bible tells us, and Christ and St. Paul tell us again and again, the truth is that the cross was a sign of triumph. The cross brought and continues to bring humanity into the fullness of life, the fullness of reunion. It is there where all divisions, real and imagined, collapsed and continue to collapse. It is there where we know ourselves bound for life, bound for union in heaven, where there is only the gaze of the Savior and the response in love of the people he cherishes. And so in these days, yes, this side of heaven, to follow Christ might indeed divide us from the things and sometimes the people who are striving for something else. It may even feel as if we, with the heart of Mary, have been pierced with a sword. But this is not the end of Jesus' story, and it is certainly not the end of ours. For at the last, scripture says, God will dwell with us, and we will be his people, and he will be our God. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one seated upon the throne will declare and declare and declare, Behold, my children, I am making all things new. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.